I'm John Little of OmegaShock.com, and this is the Weekend Shockcast for Saturday, October 11th, 2014. I want to believe that America can be rescued. I want America to be that shining city on a hill that beckons the nations of the world to truth, righteousness, and freedom. I want her to be one nation under God. I want her to be the country that demonstrates the love of Christ to the world. Unfortunately, America is not that country and cannot be that country unless the body of Christ in America turns from their wickedness, asks forgiveness from God, and sincerely follows the Lord in humility and truth. Until that happens, there can be no hope of rescue for our beloved country, and I do not see evidence of any of this happening. If I did, I would be far more optimistic. It really is our sin that has taken us down this road into insanity. It was our wickedness that opened the gates to the enemy, and we welcomed that enemy with open arms. That enemy is bent upon our destruction, and it has finally gathered enough power to make a bid for complete control. And when that takeover occurs, the doors will close, and the music will stop. The big question is whether you want to be where you are right now when that happens. If you've come to realize that you are stuck in the asylum, it's time to get out while you still can. I really don't know how much time that you have left. So, what did we talk about this week? This week we talked about how insane we've become. Alexandra spoke of the best place to be in South America. Sarah and Gary talked about relocating within the U.S. And I talked about my own story of Taiwan and Israel. So let's talk about that. On Monday, it was, we've gone insane, it's time to escape the asylum. I see crazy people, lots and lots of crazy people. Thankfully, if you are reading or listening to this, you are probably not one of them. However, you are probably stuck in the midst of a country full of crazy people, and I wish that it wasn't so. One of the things that I have learned about dealing with crazy people is that you can't change them. Only God can do that. And when God says that he isn't going to cure the insanity, well, it's time to look elsewhere for what God wants you to do. Worse, when you spend too much time with crazy people, their insanity rubs off on you. So I highly recommend that you escape the asylum while the crazy people are still willing to let you out. Living abroad can really help clear your head of cultural foolishness. Of course, you run the risk of picking up other cultural foolishness, but at least you have a clear view of what your own culture is. Well, when I limped back to the U.S. after 14 years in Israel, I returned to a country that had left sanity behind. It was 2006, and the moral decline of America had gone into freefall. Then God brought a wonderful woman into my life, and I dragged this lovely woman back to Israel, and then on to Taiwan. And as I look back at the country of my birth, I find it hard to believe how insane we have become. Are we so different from everyone else that you and I are the only ones to see it? Of course, there are none so blind as those who will not see. John Haywood America is blind by choice, which makes the U.S. a dangerous place for those who choose to see. That thought was brought home to me with astonishing clarity when I went to Steve Quayle's website and looked through the links that he had put up on Sunday. If you can get through what I'm about to show you below without screaming, well, you are a better man or woman than I am. I provide a video of the opening statement by Judge Jeanine Pirro. Ebola in the USA, are Americans safe? When you watch that, well, I have to ask you, have you started screaming yet? No? Okay, here's more. Alex Jones came forward with, Ebola rolls out exactly as predicted. After that video, I was pacing the floor and yelling in outrage by the time that was over. My poor wife had to ask her gorilla of a husband to go back to his desk and calm down. I think that I need a banana. By the way, you'll also see this link on Steve Quayle's website. It's called Deadly Marburg Hemorrhagic Fever Breaks Out in Uganda. 
Marburg is in the same family of filoviruses as Ebola, and it's a very small family. This will mark the third hemorrhagic filovirus outbreak. What is the statistical probability of three such viruses breaking out naturally at the same time? If you need a hint, the word starts with a Z. Oh, for another hint, here's this from Steve's alert section. Quote, After analyzing the Ebola RNA sequence, it is apparent that this RNA sequence gene has a high level of recombination sequences that have been placed between several gene sequences. It is my interpretation that this virus has gone through no less than 33 recombination events with markers indicative of laboratory splicing, leaving sticky ends that provide for recombination with foreign RNA. Close quote. You can find the rest of that alert in Steve Quayle's alert section. Of course, that's an unconfirmed report, and I try to be careful with such things, but I include it here because it rings true to me, which means that this is a planned event. However, you've probably figured this out, and if you haven't, you know of various planned events in the past. Satan is the father of such things, and managing your perception of reality is his favorite lie of all. So my greatest upset doesn't center on the fact that this was planned. No, my greatest upset is over the fact that my fellow Americans have swallowed the insanity of it whole. If we had an ounce of sanity in our collective consciousness, we would have demanded that the U.S. issue a complete global quarantine of anyone and everyone leaving sub-Saharan Africa. But we don't have an ounce of sanity in our collective consciousness, so it's time to exit the collective. Seriously, it's exit time. Now, it's possible to exit the collective in the area where you are, but that would mean getting it to as remote a location as possible and building a community of people who aren't insane. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left to build such communities of sanity, and there aren't very many sane people left to build them with. But if you are determined to stay in the U.S., I recommend getting started on your community building project now. Good luck with that. Maybe I'm too cynical, but I struggle to believe that too many such communities will be successful. However, if the Lord directs you to do such a thing, you must follow what the Lord tells you. For the rest of you, exiting the insane collective means leaving the U.S. Some of you have already written to me about your plans to do so, and those messages are wonderful to read. It really eases my mind to know that brothers and sisters in Christ have taken steps to get out of harm's way as well as serving the Lord as they do it. Please understand that I am not interested in helping you prolong a comfortable, self-absorbed life. Our job is to serve the Lord, and I want you to survive what is coming so that you can do that. If you aren't interested in serving the Lord, please go back to your television, your career, your Facebook friends, and your megachurch. I can't help you, and I'm not interested in doing so. The big question is, where do you go? I'm glad you asked that, and I hope to be talking about relocation over the next few days, Lord willing. But don't wait for me to write about this. Start thinking about it now. On Tuesday, it was Escape the Asylum to South America. I don't like the idea that there are so few voices out there that describe ways to escape what is coming and to serve the Lord while they are doing it. My own experience and understanding are just that, mine. What the Lord wants for you may be entirely different, and I do not want to get in the way of God's direction in your life. So when Alexandra Devereaux reached out to me with her own experience in relocation, I jumped on the chance to provide you with another voice of someone who was obedient to the calling of the Lord. The Lord may be leading you in a different direction than Alexandra's, but I hope that her story will motivate you to submit to God's hand in your life. Her article is titled, Are You Contemplating Relocation? Let me read that. I can't read in Alexandra's voice, but I will do my best. Are you contemplating relocation? Relocation can be a bit tricky if you do not do your own homework thoroughly. It also requires knowing yourself, knowing what you can tolerate and what you cannot. 
But in these coming times, know that you are going to have to stretch that tolerance and faith to a point of near breaking, as nothing will be as it ever has been before. However, the single most important aspect before considering relocation is your communication with the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you have not given it any thought so far or are struggling with the idea presently. Well, I assure you, turning this decision over to the Lord as I did is your best option, as He alone knows what path is best for you. After reading this article, you will realize it may not be easy, but if you are truly to be in some other place, the Lord will take you there. As proof of that statement, I offer to you my personal story of a journey of obedience to the Lord after being told by the Holy Spirit to leave the U.S., Back in 2005, I vividly remember the message I received from the Holy Spirit. I was being told I was going to leave the U.S., a country where I was born and raised. That was an astounding and confusing message, to say the least. But because I had been a flight attendant for 20 years, travel was not such a foreign idea. But living outside of the only home I had ever known, well, that was a horse of a different color. I pondered that idea for three days. I prayed, hoping I was going to be told it was just a mistake, but no such thing. I was going to have to go. Obedience, that is what the Lord wanted from me. I did not even know why I had to go at that time. I always wondered over the course of all these many years why I had to go to so many countries to find the one he chose for me. But I suppose I am answering that question right now, as I write this article for the benefit of all of you, to impart all that I have learned. O oh Lord, how you paved my way! I began to accept this cup, which I now knew was not going to pass from me, and decided I would not waste any more time before looking for that singular land he wanted for me. With that thought, I began my research, followed by actually traveling to all the countries I felt had potential. Each time I ventured out, I was certain that God was going to make this easy by pointing me in the right direction. After all, I was doing what he wanted of me, right? Alas, that was not to be the case. In the beginning, I was not as savvy about what was the most important criteria, as you will note. As time went on, I became more cogent to the need for safety as a primary aspect, as opposed to some of the superficial criteria I had initially sought. Don't get me wrong, I know it is a complicated and emotionally draining process as you boil down the basic top needs you require before even contemplating a move out of the U.S., but safety cannot be compromised. Once you realize that our dear country, the U.S., is the bullseye, you are caught between a rock and a hard place in your mind. You know you must leave, but your heart tugs at your memory bank while the normalcy bias kicks in. No doubt about it, it is gut-wrenching. As the world digresses, you will see that choosing a safe haven country is like the three reasons you apply to buying real estate. Location, location, location. So keep this in the forefront of your mind as we sojourn to my final destination, which might be yours too. I happened to be watching CNBC one morning when the regulars brought on some VP from a company called Jeffries International. They were still yawning and drinking their coffee when this guy, Stephen, last name withheld, just shocks the heck out of everyone. He started talking about the Amero dollar. What? The uh, what? Whoa, Nelly. The fuzzy slippers flew off as I choked on my coffee. At that time, this was not on anyone's radar, so Stephen became a very intriguing interview. To make a long story short, yep, I decided I was going to find that fellow and contact him. What chutzpah I had. After a short search on the net, I found his company, called, and presto, I am on a tie line to London. What would I say? Oh, hello? Yes, you don't know me, but... Well, that's how it went. I was so original. He took my call to my amazement and proceeded to spend some 25 minutes imparting a great deal of knowledge to me that would later prove to be invaluable. Little did I know at the time, that was the beginning of the Holy Spirit sending me down the Autobahn. Because of this very conversation, the choices of relocation were whittled down considerably. Europe was out, Canada was out, 
Russia was out, Mexico and most of Central America were out, New Zealand and Australia were iffy, all islands were crossed off the list, leaving some of South America, and if you want to go to China, start learning Mandarin. Right, I have enough trouble with English. So I headed for Panama City. It was Central America, but I was going to give it a shot, because at that time, Panama was the darling of some international relocation companies and financial groups specializing in offshore investing. They had a machine going on down there. Construction was fast and furious. Trump was in Panama City. Scores of high-rise condos were going up faster than one could imagine. But Panama City holds two-thirds of the total population of Panama's three million people, so I felt that the city was not an appropriate place. I moved on to a very small town called Boquet. It is on the other side of the country, just 35 miles from the Costa Rican border. I had heard of a very unique community called Valle Escondido, built by Sam Taliaferro. Sam has since gone to be with the Lord. He told me that he had been inspired by Doug Casey of Casey Research. Doug had encouraged him to sell his semiconductor company in Costa Rica and build a safe haven community. Sam built a beautiful little paradise within a small valley surrounded by mountains. Very lovely homes were ensconced along the mountainside, some on the valley floor. An array of well-designed condos and townhomes were built by the entrance. This was all tied together with a nine-hole golf course, a little village of shops and restaurants, an equestrian center, and a first-class clubhouse with an impressive indoor swimming pool. All were neatly kept and very attractive. We sauntered into the town. Unfortunately, it wasn't much, especially for spoiled North Americans. But the true problem was that it rained so much in Panama. There are often flash floods, landslides, collapsing roads, loads of mold, and, well, you get the picture. But I have to say that coffee gets a five-star rating. Nonetheless, I knew this was not the place. Where next? After reading about Ecuador and the fact that gasoline was a dollar a gallon, an important criteria that grabbed my attention, I booked a flight, packed a bag, and was on my way to Quito. Nice flight on LAN Airlines. As a former flight attendant, I couldn't help but notice that this was a first-class operation. I was booked at the Swiss Hotel in downtown, where I was to attend a seminar on all things Ecuadorian. Quito, the capital city of Ecuador and its surrounding neighborhoods, ghettos, encompass a population of nearly 13 million I knew if this country was going to hold any promise, I would have to find an area with less density. After three days of real estate salesmen and propaganda, I ventured out to the north, to a town called Cotacachi. It was a small town consisting of a nice array of restaurants, shops, spectacular leather goods, which were so inexpensive. One could not also help but notice how lovely and friendly the people were. The cobblestone streets were very sound, as most of Ecuador has a very well-built road system. I went to see some newer housing communities. The units themselves were adequate, but they were built around abandoned properties or shacks surrounded the properties. Then I asked about the two mountains flanking the town. Oh, see, said our guide, these are our two majestic volcanoes. Volcanoes? Oh, no. So exit, stage left. So I went south to Coincha, a bustling town of 500,000 people. The food was great, the water is drinkable from the tap, and the weather was cool at night and sunny in the day. Nice, yet again, too much density. So I meandered over to see the coast. When I arrived, I was expecting light sandy beaches, but found that the sand was blackish. That came from, yes, the volcano activity at one time. Hmm. Well, I proceeded to Baya del Caracuez, a tiny peninsula on the Pacific coast. It was a small fishing village with some okay condos, a miniature yacht club, sort of, and the best cheap lunch I ever ate. Half of a chicken, rice, beans, and a drink for a dollar fifty. Between the food and the gasoline prices and their coffee, I awarded a few gold stars to Ecuador. 
But the rampant socialist political climate, the volcanoes, the broken economic and banking systems, and the fact that Ecuador was using the dollar like Panama quickly led me to determine that this was also not the land God had intended for me. So, no to Ecuador. Back home again, I was taking a respite, while I was forging ahead to look for another country. In the meantime, some friends of mine invited me to go back to their home in Colombia. They were unaware that I was on a quest to find a new home, so I just accepted and went. We flew into Bogota, where I had been many years before in my airline days. What a transformation! New roads, a great bus system, shopping malls, restaurants, etc. Frankly, before it looked like a literal pile of rubble. In Bogota, we stayed in a very interesting place called Colina Campestra. It is a highly secure but fancy complex with restaurants, a hotel, bowling alley, disco, golf course, indoor swimming pools, skeet shooting area, horseback riding, and so on. Designed for the elite generals who came for the weekends with their respective families. My friend had connections, you might say, and the cost? $33 a night. It was centrally located and right off the main highway system, allowing us to travel to other cities and towns. The weather was rainy, then sunny, chilly, then mild, but it was a large city, and I knew I would not be living in such a large metropolitan area, so we ventured out. Suffice to say, Colombia is beautiful. But of all the cities and towns I saw, there was only one town that had some real charm. That was Chia. It is north of Bogota, a place where the old town still is revered, while a new modern area was added. That contrast gave me pause. Antiquity and modernity, in a nutshell, were the best of two worlds. The grocery store was very up-to-date, ensconced next to the new mall and a very attractive gated community called Santa Ana. One month after my return, a bomb went off in the new Chia Mall. Above the town on the hillside was another gated community where the soap opera stars of Colombia had houses. The view from the top and the homes were both spectacular. The air quality was far better than the pollution of Bogota proper. I also had the chance to ride a beautiful white horse up the hills in La Colera, just north of Chia, a truly spectacular mountainous area with vistas like picture postcards. But no matter how beautiful Colombia was, it was still infiltrated by the drug biz, violence, and the, and the infamous FARC jingo kidnappings were an undeniable reality there. So, no to Colombia. Oh, I did forget to mention a rather interesting opportunity which presented itself on that trip. I had the pleasure of meeting with the president of Colombia on that trip. It was just some mischief of the friends who had invited me. Well, I did. Alvaro Uribe was a very polished and polite chap. He, we spoke for over 15 minutes while the newsreels were rolling. The president's press secretary took my name for the record and then proceeded to tell me that she would be sending me an invitation to tour the presidential palace on my next visit. Sorry to say, I did not return to Colombia because that night I found myself on the 6 o'clock news. Too much exposure for an Americano in the land of the disappearing gringos. My friends spirited me out the next day. Adios, Colombia. Upon my return from this escapade, I became more determined to find my place. I just kept thinking I was wandering around as if lost in the desert, like our biblical forefathers. I surely hoped it would take less time than what these ancestors had to endure. But the Lord was putting me through my paces. I prayed and prayed in my desperation, and the Holy Spirit was silent, as if I were deaf. I then seized on the idea of Chile. Yeah, that was it. The travel logs looked enticing. The country was quite unique, with all the different choices of temperature zones. Deserts to penguins, a sprawling wine country, beautiful coastal towns, abundant food, and the very sophisticated city of Santiago, with the majestic Andes as a backdrop. And let us not forget Pablo Neruda, the famous poet. So before I go on and on, I'm going to end this trip here because I then discovered that Chile is sitting just off a tectonic plate. Remember I told you that safety was important? Whatever Chile has going for it, it is nonetheless on the Nazca plate. What is that? 
It means when the Lord gets ready to rattle and roll this planet in these last days, Chile is going to have some real problems. Scuba, anyone? So no to Chile. Now, what is left? There is Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, since I eliminated Peru, Bolivia, Venezuela, and Paraguay. The losers have so many strikes against them, I just tossed them out the window. Peru is dangerously infested with the Shining Path, shamans, and the occult. Now, Bolivia, what's in Bolivia except Lake Titicaca? Next is Venezuela. It is a socialist morass of chaos, like finding oneself going from the flying pan to the fire. And lastly, Paraguay, a country where dangerous shrubs and a certain evil moon have a potential to lurk. So, no, no, and no. And now my former feelings of desperation feel good in comparison to what I am experiencing presently, since years have passed from when I first commenced my search. I am beginning to wonder if God has forgotten my name. Regardless of prayers beseeching the Lord for help and guidance, there is silence. I am not going to give up, however, and am more determined than ever as I rally again to try Argentina. It is a land of pampas, gauchos, superb beef, the tango, Buenos Aires, the Paris of South America, and the uniquely beautiful area, Bariloche, which happens to be my favorite place in nearly all the world. Then in the northwest is the small town of Cafayate. It is famous for the safe haven community which Doug Casey finally built himself, Estancia de Cafayate a beautiful equestrian community with an 18-hole golf course, exquisitely designed homes set within their own vineyards and organic gardens. The mountains flank each side with their rust-colored hue, enhanced by a very big blue sky. I ask myself again, this country has to be it, right? Ah, sadly, no. Why? You guessed it, because it is in Argentina. Unfortunately, if it were not for those who have destroyed the government of a proud and industrious people, Argentina would currently be a burgeoning country since it is rich in resources and culture. But as we know, they do not stand alone in these crimes. We as God's people know the true causation of which I speak, and we know it is pervasive and the very reason I am on this journey. I realize at this point most folks would have just given up, thinking they really did not hear the message. But I knew that was not true, and so I was still compelled to continue my journey. If there is one thing that I am, it is determined, or maybe just plain stubborn like that of a Rottweiler. Some have mistaken me for a Chihuahua. Big mistake. Either way, my mind and heart were still focused on my promise to be obedient and find where God wanted me to be. So again, I returned home to the U.S. feeling utterly defeated. What could be next? I am so tired. I am praying and I am confused. What are you trying to show me, dear Lord? I am waiting for a download from you, Holy Spirit. And again, nothing happened. So when some folks I met along the way in all my travels called and said they wanted to go to Antigua, Guatemala, because there was a community being built there that we want to see, I packed and flew out to meet them for a look-see. I prayed the whole flight, let this be the place. What a shock! We were aghast at Guatemala City. We did not know it, but a few days before our departure, the airport was closed because of a volcanic explosion and a sinkhole which swallowed up 70-some homes, not to mention the poor little CNN reporter who went to the Lord when a giant rock hit her in the head. Oh my, not another volcano country. It was literally a nightmare. We quickly were spirited into Antigua by our driver. What a difference. Here nestled in the mountains at 5,000 feet sat this charming little town, a true dichotomy of what we saw in the city. Green mountains in all directions, cobblestone streets like a patchwork quilt, loads of great restaurants, hotels, superb coffee, so-so grocery stores but adequate, and some truly gorgeous housing. And the weather was literally perfect, not too hot, not too cold, and very little rain. I rented a five-bedroom house with a full upper deck, vaulted ceilings, massive rock fireplace, granite kitchen with all the North American accoutrement, several gardens, a gardener, a maid, all lavishly furnished, and a garage for $1,000 per month. 
The weather was glorious, the people were nice, and the house was divine. Was this the place? Not really. It was a tourist town, and that was getting old. Those green mountains, yep, they were volcanoes, but the following was to be the additional nail in the coffin. We ventured to meet some U.S. expats every Thursday morning for breakfast adjacent to the town square. After a month or so, we found out that some very nefarious activities were ongoing in the Central Park Square, operated by the same expats, the nature of which was so serious it led to the Holy Spirit telling me to leave. Oh, I was so glad to hear something. I wasn't deaf or worse forgotten. But even more importantly, that same afternoon I happened to come across a bit of information on the Internet by complete accident that would come to change my life in ways I could never have imagined. And so I left, never to return again. Again, it was a resounding no to Guatemala from the Holy Spirit. Back again in the U.S., I realize that all my neighbors, friends, and family think I am ready for a mental ward. I keep leaving only to come back like a boomerang. I suppose it seemed strange to everyone but me. All I knew was that I had two more countries to go, Brazil and Uruguay. But I just did not have the steam to continue at that moment. So here I was, back where I had started because the Holy Spirit told me to go home. What had I done wrong? I'm supposed to leave, but to where? And that forty years in the desert thing was ringing in my head. I knew one thing, the Lord would never abandon me, even though at this point I was spent, confused, and at the end of my rope. I kept saying to myself, he must have had a very special reason for all of this. Then something did happen, something amazing, and it could never have happened if I had not gone back home as the Holy Spirit had directed me to do. Without reciting all the details which led to my being propelled out of Guatemala, that bit of information I found on the internet that day connected me to a special group of people that would be the catalyst which led me to my promised land. Of course, during all this time I was completely unaware of the multidimensional chess game being managed by God on my behalf. Years passed, and one day the subject of my leaving became front and center again, but this time I pulled that lever and it all lined up like three cherries in a row. Now I take a jaunt to Uruguay at the urging of a friend. Go check it out for yourself, and this was exactly what I did. As the plane neared the coastline, all I could see was the greenest grass. I said to myself, this country looks like a giant golf course. Now as we taxi in towards the terminal, I took a double take. This terminal looks like a giant flying saucer. Oh my, these folks have a sense of humor here. I had been up for two days with no sleep, so some of this personal amusement was lack of sleep. As I step off the plane, I am greeted by the most meticulously polite airport personnel, sporting friendly smiles while helping me with my carry-on luggage. I had forgotten what gracious travel had felt like. But in Uruguay, you are treated with respect. A young man came out of nowhere and collected my bags as I stood pointing at each bag rolling off the conveyor. Politely he whisked me through security and to the taxi stand. The taxi driver proceeded to take me to the hotel, and after arriving he unloaded my luggage, carried it inside the hotel for me, and kissed me on the cheek, saying, Welcome to Uruguay. Then the people behind the front desk said, You must be Alexandra. Welcome to Uruguay. From this point forward, every day I was there, it was as if I was some celebrity. Previously, I had met the brother of the man who oversees the Uruguayan consulate in Miami some months before. Well, upon discovering that I am headed to Uruguay, he insisted on amending his visit with his brother and flying back down to Uruguay so he could take me on a tour of the country. He came to get me at my hotel with his great smile and warm demeanor. I hardly know this guy, but now he is chauffeuring me to Punta del Este and La Barra, up the coast from Montevideo, the capital city. Once my eyes saw that area, I was in love with Uruguay. He took me to his home to meet his wife and children. I stayed in a dazzling boutique hotel, just up the street from their lovely home, directly on the La Barra Inlet. There was no charge, as this was his friend Nico, who was the owner, a sweet and generous soul. 
how lovely it was and how welcoming they were to a stranger. I was totally overwhelmed by their hospitality. Diego began to escort me all over Punta del Este as well. It looked just like the U.S., a small town of some 30,000 people, off-season and rather elegant, from the yacht basin to the many luxury hotels and condos lining the rolling sandy beaches, beautiful homes, and neighborhoods, many restaurants, an American-style shopping mall, multiple upscale grocery stores to rival and surpass any we have in the U.S., car dealerships, hospitals, hardware and paint stores, an entire street called the Design District, and on and on. Instantly, one could see how livable a town it was. As you have already read, I traveled to a myriad of countries in South America, but this place, well, it is just unique, the crown jewel of South America. It not only looked like home, it felt like home. At that moment, I realized my journey was over. I wept profusely and thanked God for bringing me here. I had not done anything wrong. I was not deaf. He had not forgotten my name. He had just saved the best place for me. My obedience delivered me to my promised land. After being treated like a VIP, I returned to Montevideo to spend my last weekend in the big city. I bid Diego goodbye and knew I had made a good friend and acquired a family in Uruguay. The next day I went to the shopping mall where a young boy about 14 came up to me. He said, I heard you speaking English. Are you American? All I had to do is say yes. And three more little friends gathered around me. They asked me if I could tell them about the U.S. Constitution and more importantly, if the United States was founded for God. Well, I was more than surprised. With that I took them for lunch and ice cream while answering their many intelligent questions. They all walked me back to my hotel, carefully escorting me across every street, and then each of them said goodbye and gave me a kiss on the cheek as they left. How utterly adorable. I thought I was in a movie, as none of this whole trip seemed real, but there was more to come. Two days later on Saturday, the phone in my room rang. It was Morrow, the little boy from the mall. He told me that his parents are so grateful that I had taken his friends and him for lunch they wanted to invite me to their family luncheon tomorrow. Now I know I am in a movie. Naturally, I accept since I don't want to miss the show. At 1 p.m. sharp Sunday afternoon, Morrow and his lovely mother, Mariana, arrive to pick me up at the hotel. Off we go to this chic little restaurant, La Perdiz, where Alfredo, the husband, and Chiara, the daughter, are waiting under a colorful umbrella in this outdoor cafe. To make a long story short, the luncheon was tremendous, the conversation friendly and genuine, encouraged by a bit of fabulous Uruguayan wine. A good time was had by all. Thinking lunch was over, I began to thank them for their hospitality when Alfredo asked if I would like to see their weekend home. So poodle and all, we trekked 30 minutes outside the city to Marina Santa Lucia, a very extraordinary upscale community of homes on a canal off the Santa Lucia River. Oh my, it was simply gorgeous. As I am escorted by Maro throughout the house and then into the backyard, I see this large and extravagant yacht. I said, what a stunning yacht. Alfredo said, do you like boats? Ah, this was no boat. I answer in the affirmative. He says, would you like to take a ride? No doubt now I am in a movie. And it is a great one, because minutes later I am flying down the Santa Lucia River in their fabulous yacht with four people I have never met before being in Uruguay. And it is as though we are family. Now, to make my point, this just happens to be the last day I am in Uruguay, as my flight departed at 11 p.m. Who could have imagined that anything else unusual could happen? Well... We get back in the car and proceed to my hotel. We kiss and hug and say goodbye. Oh, my heart did thump. That little Morrow was a heartbreaker. I am now at the airport approaching my gate. I have a few minutes to catch my breath when I hear, Alexandra! Who do I turn to find but Diego's brother from the Uruguayan consulate waving to me as he walks over to, yep, you guessed it, kiss me on the cheek. I think it's time to disclose something about Uruguayan culture they do not shake hands. They kiss you on the cheek instead, in case you were thinking something else. What a country. At that point, he says, I 
changed my flight so you would have some company. Yeah, yeah. It's a movie, all right. Real life doesn't happen this way. So I'm going to wait for the sequel since the first movie was so darn good. Now this time I return home with confidence. I started packing up my household. The neighbors are now more than curious. My family is questioning me and my friends know for sure that I am no longer a sane person. Within months this sequel unfolded as I was living on that beautiful inlet in La Barra thanks in large part to Diego, my first and best friend in Uruguay. Yes, it really does look like a movie set. Wait until you see it. Shortly thereafter, I had made many friends, so I decided to give a Thanksgiving party. Little did I know it was to be the most famous party La Barra would ever see. Thirty-eight people showed up, including Alfredo, Mariana, Mauro, and Chiara and their yacht captain. They had driven all the way from Montevideo to be there. People I barely knew came, especially this darling little man who came up to me after dinner and said, I would like to sing for your guest. I thought, well, you know what I thought. I said, how nice of you, in the most polite manner I could muster. I said a silent prayer with this frozen smile on my face and hoped for the best. Well, all the large glass doors of this very large apartment were open that were facing the inlet in the town. This is an important point, as this man steps up and starts to sing, and sing he did. And with those doors open, the entire town could hear the magnificent voice of Eduardo Comangian, one of Uruguay's finest opera stars. Within minutes, Alfredo realizes who he was, as well as Professor Pablo Magone, another of my guests. They are cheering wildly. Eight operas later, Eduardo wraps it up with Granada, the entire township, and everyone who was in attendance is still talking about it. Yeah, I know, it's the best sequel on the planet, but then again, just imagine who was the producer and director. Life is a journey, where we can choose to obey God, placing our lives in His hands, or struggle in disobedience. But curiously, sometimes the struggle is the journey God had intended for us. We just have to find the wisdom to know the difference, and our faith with our hope in Him will always deliver us to the right destination in all things. God knows what is best for us, and His timing is always correct. We must also learn to forge an understanding of His appointed time, then trust with all of our hearts that He will deliver all that He has promised through faith, hope, and most importantly, obedience. Matthew 21.2 says, Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Psalms 31.24 says, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Isaiah 1.19 If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Now for some facts on Uruguay. Alexander provides a video, and it's called Uruguay Information, Live in Uruguay, Uruguay Travel, join Uruguay.com. You can see it in the article. Someone recently emailed me asking, uh, yeah, where is that? Is that near Indonesia? Oh boy, I know it is a small country, but let us review our geography. It is located just under the big bulge of Brazil on the Atlantic coast of South America, and to the south and west lies Argentina. Uruguay is blessed with rambling hills, 180 kilometers of sandy beaches, the largest water reserves in all of South America, 12 million head of cattle, 10 million head of sheep, oranges, and rice in the north, olives, blueberries, and grapes nearly everywhere else. Suffice to say, this country has some of the finest farmland in the world. This is true abundance, as there are only 3 million people in the country. When you arrive here, you will instantly know these people are very, very special. As an example of their caring hearts, I will tell you what happened when I became rather ill with pneumonia this winter. Well, the entire staff of the condo where I lived, the developer secretaries, friends I knew, and folks I barely knew were all hovering over me with soups and treats and caring wishes. They proclaimed, You are not alone, Alexandra. One gal sent her father to see me, who was a doctor. He showed up, and we were both so surprised. He was a man I knew. He was also the president of what we would call the Chamber of Commerce here in our town. We had met at a big meeting some months before. 
I tried to pay him, but he softly but firmly refused to take any money. Their concerns were beyond what your own family would be if they knew you were ill. Next, the condo staff went to the grocery store, pharmacy, etc. Then my great friends Natalia and Ernesto came to give me their medicines of choice. Honey from their chakra ranch, bee propolis, hot teas, homemade chicken soup, and you guessed it, mos besos. Right on the cheek. After recovering, my dear friend Diego took me shopping and carried all the groceries up to my 18th floor apartment. Yes, I know. It has to be a movie. The energy for the high-speed internet system is provided by hydroelectric power. The road systems are excellent. There is virtually no violent crime either. That is not to say that there are no purse snatchers or pickpockets, but all in all, you never hear of any crime. It exists. It exists, but it is a scintilla of what we have in the U.S., which is a high-crime, high-murder-rate country. But not here. I recently completed my exams to obtain my health care at the local hospital. I was told because I was older than the limit allowed to get approved. But just like everything else, I was connected to someone who got me into the best program. This program includes cancer treatments, transplant replacements, tests, and all the other obvious procedures. It is going to cost a whopping $82 a month. That ought to get your attention. And yes, the doctors are highly qualified and are very caring. How would you like to pay an additional $35 a month so if you do get sick, the doctor just comes to your house? Rather unbelievable, I know. A bit weary of traffic tickets? Hey, there are no militarized police here. In fact, you see some little police cars, but they are peace officers. They do not stop you or give you a ticket. Revenue generating is not a part of their duties. However, if you cause an accident or get caught robbing someone, they are tough. But for the average person just driving around town, they are next to invisible. You are shaking your head in d disbelief, I see. I have been also asked about the price of food. It depends on the item. Anything imported is a bit more expensive, but basics are the same as in the U.S. and in some cases lower. Food quality is very high, and there is much variety. Just sometimes in the meat department, you are not really sure what part of the cow is in that package. However, all the chicken is recognizable. The not-so-good news is that the average coffee is truly horrible, and I know some people who cannot live without their coffee. Well, sorry to say, if you move to Uruguay, you will have to part with a few bucks to get the good stuff, or find a source to fly in a supply. Coffee donations are gladly accepted. As for housing, if you are diligent, you will find reasonably priced luxury apartments and homes. The key is to rent annually. This small town of Punta del Este has a population of about 30,000 people for nine and a half months of the year, because this is a place where the wealthy Argentinians and Brazilians come to summer. As they say, from December 15th to April 15th, it can swell to 150,000 to 200,000 people. It is the only place I have found in South America where you think you are in the U.S. That is why I call it the crown jewel. Single-family homes are a bit harder to find at moderate prices, but the prices of luxury apartments are softening due to the recent bankruptcy of Argentina. Most all have great facilities as indoor and outdoor pools, tennis court, health clubs, yards, and, and swing sets for children, as well as party rooms equipped with their own built-in barbecue. This is very Uruguayan. Every Sunday, all the families have dinner together as Dad grills the meat. Montevideo, the capital, is a city of over one million people. For our purposes, avoiding heavily populated areas will be preferable in the future. Nevertheless, it is fun to visit, where a plethora of goods and services are to be had. But my recommendation is Punta del Este. If you decide to relocate, it is a good place to reorient and start to acclimate to the paradigm shift, feeling more like an American way of life. Nevertheless, the real name of the game will be to achieve a self-sustaining lifestyle in the future, that being phase two. That is when you do your due diligence and buy some real estate. From what the Holy Spirit has told me, moving from city to a farm should be my ultimate goal. And for those who do come, perhaps God will bless us with like-minded companionship. We may find some nice neighbors in the farms adjacent. 
who just happened to have also heard the Holy Spirit beckoning them to this beautiful and safe land. And as I said before, safety being a major criteria, Uruguay is a good choice. There is no oil here, nor are there large caches of precious metals or others to co- for others to covet. There are no alphabet agencies, no natural disasters like hurric- hurricanes, tornadoes, tidal waves, earthquakes, tectonic plates, etc. For now, Uruguay is off the radar, making this one of the more peaceful countries in the world. But mainly, we should always remember that our safest refuge is the Lord. Presently, Uruguay is still a place where Americans can open bank accounts, be granted residency, and then ultimately obtain citizenship without much hoopla. These prospects are drying up in many other parts of the world, therefore this is something important to consider. Now, for the not-so-inexpensive side of Uruguay, cars are expensive, about 35% more expensive. Gasoline may be $7 a gallon, but this is a small country where the things are conveniently located, and you do not have to drive long distances on a regular basis to conduct basic everyday business. This is some basic knowledge of the good, the bad, and not so ugly regarding Uruguay. As you have read, I have been to many countries or have researched the rest in detail, giving you some contrast. Therefore, I hope that you will find the story of my journey that God intended for me to be of help to all of you. Lastly, I wish to thank John Little. He is a watchman who exemplifies great love for his fellow man. I'm blushing here. As all watchmen do, by the very nature of their ever-vigilant commitment to warn their brothers and sisters. As a former magazine publisher myself, I know the amount of work and diligence it takes to produce this blog, as well as all his other endeavors. Thank you, John, for all you do, and may God continue to bless you in your work. Your sister in Christ, Alexandra Devereux. Thank you, Alexandra. I appreciate that. Now for my own thoughts on what Alexandra wrote. What a great article. What a great story of following the Lord's direction, even when it doesn't make sense sometimes. You cannot lose if you place your future in the hands of God. When all is said and done, each of you will have a different story to tell of where and how God led you in the days that come. The choices that you make will be different than Alexandra's, because God has a different place and role for each of us. By the way, if you have also followed the Lord's hand in your life and chosen to relocate, whether within the U.S. or outside the U.S., Share your experience with us. Better yet, write an article. Alexandra is obviously a great writer, which meant that I didn't need to do any editing except headings and three typos. But I am more than willing to help you edit and polish what you write. I really want Omega Shock readers to hear as many voices as possible to help encourage them to take the direction that God is calling them. Whatever your situation, please be encouraged by Alexandra's story and redouble your efforts to seek the Lord and follow His will. God may tell you to stay where you are, or He may lead you to some other spot on the planet. The main point is to seek the Lord and submit to His will. May the Lord guide us all in the dark days ahead. On Thursday, it was Escape the Asylum Within America. Sorry that there was no shock letter yesterday. I have learned that when the words don't come, it's time to be quiet. But today, I present yet two more voices to add to Monday's excellent article by Alexandra. Sarah and Gary have stepped forward with their stories of relocating within the U.S. Sarah and her husband moved to South Tennessee, and Gary and his wife relocated farther away from Atlanta, Georgia. Sarah and Gary have two very different approaches, yet both are very, very relevant, and both speak to the same kinds of challenges that you will face as you seek the Lord for where and how you will prepare for the dark days ahead. One thread that runs through all the stories that I know about relocation is the struggle involved. None of the stories that I know, including my own, are ever free of struggle and challenge. You will face challenges when you seek to follow the Lord. You will be opposed, but not by God. Both Sarah and Gary were forced to wait patiently and humbly on the Lord until God showed them where and what they should be. Note, names have been changed either by myself or the authors. These are dark days and security is important. 
I will leave it to Alexandra, Sarah, or Gary to reveal their true identity should any of you find yourselves in direct communication with them. But yes, John Little is my real name. Now for Sarah's article. As inspired by Alexandra's relocation story outside of the U.S. and requested by Omega Shock for testimony of our in-state move, following is our story. My husband and I had been looking to leave Florida for many years, or at least the HOA house that we had in Central Florida. We actually were prevented in buying an overpriced house prior to the 2008 economic fall that would have moved us closer to his Cape Canaveral job, but would have devastated our finances. We kept searching in various places in the U.S. to include physical searches in Alabama, Illinois, and online searches in the Southwest and other states. A set of circumstances placed our focus in Tennessee and the wheels were set in motion. The specific property was identified by the Lord himself as it was as it was the only one that met three criteria we had discussed in private. Deer, turkey, and water. Ours had a wet water pond, not the preferred flowing stream. Once our house sold and my husband resigned his position in Florida, all hell broke loose. Rather than glory in the attack, just know it impacted body, soul, and spirit, as well as finances. We finally stopped listing all the things that kept going wrong and pressed in to complete the build and take possession of the land. We came against demonic resistance, specifically on this property, but also in the surrounding area. As my call is to work to cleanse the bride, I waited patiently for one year prior to being invited to teach the women at our fellowship what the Lord had put on my heart to share with them. I allowed for the direction of the Holy Spirit to use His vessel to select the topic, so I was delighted when she requested I teach on deliverance. At appointed intervals, I was requested to teach and manage to deliver prophetic intercession and prophetic prayer ministry, 2012 and 2013. This was taught only to the women, as that was the audience I was given. The following story was sent to my pram family and prayer partners, who have watched this journey we have been on. We felt that there had been tremendous resistance to this move and our settling here, but we just could not understand why. I believe this is the reason we were sent here, and why the resistance was so hard. The Journey Journey from September 25, 2010 through today, September 19, 2014, almost four Gregorian years. Many of you know the journey my husband and I have been on for the past four years. This week has been very revelatory. I have been home for two months now resting and working part-time, but not commuting into Huntsville. As a point of relocation, I wanted to briefly remind those who remember and tie what happened today to the vision and word the Lord gave me November of 2010. Driving to work on a Friday that month, I saw an old edifice like the Tower of Babel. A vision is difficult to explain as you are fully present, driving, yet seeing a picture I asked the Lord, What is it? I heard in my chest, This stronghold over this area. What is it, Lord? He said only two words, Seared consciences. It was a very old stronghold as the mortar was black. The blocks were massive, wider than my arms spread. It was broken and decayed, signifying many generations. The next day we drove to Pulaski. On the way there, the Holy Spirit revealed God's heart to me and I started travailing in deep intercession. All I could feel was his heart, grief, over his children. I cried out, My children, my children, I call to you, and you will not listen. You will not return to me. Your hearts are hard as stone. I was undone. When we parked at our destination, I stayed in the truck. I had two cars attempt to park next to me, but could not. I looked at the parking lot and saw a stone shaped in color and size of a human heart that was preventing cars from parking next to us. The underside was flat, and as cars slowed, the tires hit it just right to stop them. No forward motion. Our hearts are hard as stone. I picked up that stone, and as directed by my husband, placed it under the prayer bench at the high part of our property. Later, my husband added a 16-foot cross there as well, and there it all sat, mostly untouched, until today. As I have incorporated walking this month as part of my recuperation, I was on my property walking early this week, and I felt the Holy Spirit tug me to stop. So I did. 
I waited, and then asked out loud, Lord, what do you have me to see? I looked up and down the trail, up to the trees, and then down to the ground. On the ground I saw something that did not fit. Exposed was about three inches of something that seemed foreign there, so I bent down and pulled it out of the dirt mud. It was a hammer, with the downside very rusted and rough on the metal. I thought that this can't be my husband's. It seems too old, rusted for the past three years. We don't know how it would have gotten there and covered up and uncovered slightly by the water washing over it. It was right in the downward spill path of where he put one of the underground drainage for the water coming off the gutters. So this area is about 50 yards away, where the pipes stop and it starts the downhill run in the woods, and was on the lower original path area prior to dumping onto a wet water pond that is about 30 yards away. So in essence, this path is about halfway between the house, which is located in the middle of acreage, and the main road, which is past the wet water pond. It must have been buried for quite some time as it has taken this many rains to wash away the dirt. The path is an original path from when we bought the property. The hammer was placed on the back porch for two days. It is now on our mantle as of Friday. I believe the hammer represents breaking of strongholds. As I typed this sentence yesterday, I was writing this to someone, I was led to look up hammer references in the Bible. Here are two I like and that are relevant. Jeremiah 51.20 You are my war club, my weapon of war, and with you I shatter nations, and with you I destroy kingdoms. Jeremiah 23.29 Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters rock? The story of the hammer was typed and sent to my prayer partner in Florida yesterday. I knew more revelation was coming. She responded that her pastor has said revival is coming. On Thursday yesterday, I walked the path again twice. The first time I found three ripe persimmons at the same area where the hammer was found. I ate them and continued on. At the second walk in the afternoon, there were three more. I scooped those up and gave to my husband when he returned home. I don't know what that means. The only connections that I could find is that there was an old recipe using an extinct persimmon fruit to make the oil used to anoint the kings in Israel. I know that our prayers are a sweet fragrance to the Lord. Perhaps there is a connection there? This morning, Friday, as instructed by my brother, I covered my head, I wore a cap, and began to prophesy over the property. I generally pray as I walk, but I generally do not prophesy. I took the two verses above with me and the hammer, as instructed by the Holy Spirit. Now things get more interesting. As I came to the cross up where the stone heart is, I went to the cross and prayed. I knew something was supposed to happen there, but was not quite sure. So I started walking away, and was about ten yards away when Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine came to remembrance. Yes, I took that hammer and broke that heart stone as I prophesied the scripture over it. The first third broke, then it broke in half again. So, three pieces. I gathered the rocks and placed them back under the prayer bench. I continued my walk and prophesying. I stopped by to see if there were more pers persimmons. There were none. I continued on and back. This walk is one mile when complete. When I was back at the top cross, where the broken heart is, then the torrent of words came. I began to prophesy to that broken heart. I wish I had taken my recorder. I believe that the word, which is a consuming fire, has hammered, broken the hard hearts of this area and around the world. I agree with the Florida pastor. Revival has indeed started. I can say that when I was where the hammer was found on the lower part of the property, I was led to break witchcraft, darkness, and evil in the area. When I was up at the high cross, I spoke to the heart that is now able to hear the word. I spoke to disease and sickness, brokenness, and so many wonderful things as I prophesied as the Spirit led. Salvation is coming to so many whose hearts could not allow the word to seep in. I do not know the significance of that hammer. I do know that those who knew us back then knew of the resistance from hell that we had the moment the house in Florida sold and we moved here. The property is almost 18 acres. The property had to be cleared, and the house had to be sitting in just the right place for the water drainage to wear down the soil where the hammer could be exposed. 
my finding and having the heart-shaped stone ready for when the Lord would have me do something with it were all set in motion years ago. I am just a witness reporting that something happened this morning, something that all hell resisted and that heaven ordained. May you be blessed by reading these words. Mission completed. In conclusion, our journey has been a difficult one. Even during the build, I sensed that we were building this for those who would come after us. I still don't know if that means that we will be leaving soon or if we will be a Goshen, a place of refuge, his hiding place for many others he sends here. I have been in a place of prayer and fasting since this occurred. Some journeys are wonderful and smooth, while others are rocky and tough. But each one is chosen by the Father for his purpose. We would have preferred wonderful and smooth. Every day we are in training to seek his face, hear his voice, and follow his direction. I encourage those who question if you heard him when the road goes into a free fall cliff. Yes, you heard him, and even if you made a mistake, he will catch you and deliver you to the solid rock, into that strong tower, and you will be saved. Our journey continues, as does yours. Now for Gary Brewer's account. Gary wrote to me and said, quote, My own personal journey on this subject was captured in an interview with Mark from Prepper Recon. Certainly not as exciting and provocative as Alexandra, but this is where my wife and I felt led to go, moving from the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, to a rural area of the North Georgia mountains. Close quote. Having lived what many would call an exciting life, I can tell you that an exciting life is vastly overrated. Seriously, folks. Boring beats exciting, hands down. Now Gary was interviewed on Prepper Recon, and he sent me a link to his April 27th interview. I provide the video in the article, and please have a listen. It's called Homestead Learning Curve. As a footnote, Gary wrote, quote, I'll add one thing. We found a fantastic church at our new location with a very spirit-led congregation and an anointed pastor who recently taught a very powerful message on prophecy. Close quote. Hopefully, you will notice that Alexandra, Gary, Sarah, and myself have been led in completely different ways as we follow the Lord's direction. God has a plan for each of us, which means that we will not wind up in the same place. We won't follow the exact same path. We'll be directed in different ways with different words as we seek to serve the Lord. Some of us will be led into the heart of darkness to shine the light of truth. Some of us will act as a haven to those of us who can't prepare. And some of us are where we should be right now. Hopefully none of us will forget that we do not need to do more than our best because the outcome is in good hands. Rest in the Lord and follow His direction. You cannot lose if the Lord is your guide And the corollary is, without God, there can be no hope. On Friday, it was Escape the Asylum, Taiwan, and Israel. By now, most of you have probably figured out that where you live is not safe, and you face the challenge of what to do about that. As I have said repeatedly, if you can't trust your neighbors, it's time to get new ones. And getting new neighbors means moving to a place where you can trust your neighbors or where the situation isn't so dire, or both. I recommend the both part, but that means leaving the United States a very daunting prospect for anyone with an ounce of sanity. But I am an example of someone who has done that and, by the grace of God, lived to tell the tale. So let me take this time to tell my own story of relocation. Knowing a writer, or worse, being married to one, is a dangerous thing. You never know when you'll find yourself in a story that lots of people are reading. But I try to be careful about such things, so I routinely change some of the names and situations to protect the mostly innocent. I will also be telling my story a little bit backwards. I believe that the story of Israel is the most important one, but it is also complicated. Taiwan is less so in many respects, and will be an easier choice for many of you but try to understand that none of your options are without pitfalls. If you've spent any time reading my articles, you know that I live in Taiwan, more specifically Taipei. This means that I am almost exactly on the other side of the planet from most of you, 
In fact, I always know what time it is in Eastern Standard Time because we are exactly 12 hours ahead of EST. Although that changes when the U.S. goes off Daylight Standard Time, one of the many reasons why I like Taiwan is that they have refused to play such games with the clock. They think that we are crazy to switch back and forth, and I agree. Of course, the Taiwanese have their own version of insanity, so let's get to that. When the Lord dragged me out of Israel in 2006, I had no idea why. But looking back on that, I can see that he had his reasons, and I will always remember that as a lesson in trusting the Lord. Why? Because the Lord wanted me to meet one of his daughters, and he needed to get me pointed in the right direction. I wound up married to this wonderful woman before dragging her off to Israel. The poor woman didn't know what she was getting into and is still aghast at what her gorilla of a husband has dumped her in. On the way back to Israel in 2010, I thought that I would visit my mother-in-law, who lives just south of Tokyo in Yokohama. We spent a week running around Tokyo and a few outlying areas, and, well, I really don't like the place. That's a very subjective statement, and I'm sure that many of you will disagree. But there is a coldness to Japanese society left, that left me unsettled. I certainly did not feel any stirring in my spirit for that country. However, I know of many who have, and a friend of mine spent several decades there pastoring a church, sharing the gospel, and speaking Japanese. And this is one of many reasons why you should let the Lord guide you and not the subjective views of others. The Holy Spirit may lead you to places that I and many others would tell you never to go. And I'm okay with that, as long as you really are hearing from the Lord in this. But let's get back to my story. After a week in Japan, we went to Taipei, and then to my wife's hometown in, southern, in the southernmost part of Taiwan, where she grew up. And they are truly two different worlds. Taipei is a big city with 2.7 million people within the city limits and more than 8 million in the surrounding area that they call New Taipei. And it has an excellent transportation system, lots of work opportunities, and crazy drivers. I don't drive in Taipei partly because I want to avoid the cost involved, but also because I don't like having to share the road with people who drive like maniacs. Driving really is the most dangerous thing that you can do anywhere and this is especially true in Taipei. You will also find more in the way of American culture and American food. There are moments in time when I have been willing to kill for a good hamburger and was able to get one without resorting to homicide. You will also find more expat Americans to spend time with, and you will be able to get by more easily if you only speak English. In fact, for many of you, Taipei will be a much more comfortable place than the rest of Taiwan. But for those who wish to serve the Lord, the rest of Taiwan is probably where you will wind up. Here in Taipei, between 8 and 10 percent of the population is Christian. When you get away from the big city, that percentage falls to around 2 percent. And those 2 percent live in the midst of incredible darkness. In fact, for a number of reasons, I would be there now were it not for the Bible classes that my wife and I have been asked to teach. There really is much to be done in terms of the gospel for those of you willing to go out on a limb and learn Chinese. Unfortunately, that's one of the drawbacks of living outside Taipei, having to learn Chinese. It is a tough language, and I am too much of a coward to learn it. Learning Hebrew was painful enough. Learning Chinese is truly daunting to this 40-something writer. But at the same time, you will find a far more honest and traditional society outside of Taipei. The Taiwanese are a truly lovely people, and those out in the countryside are the loveliest of all. And I had more than one person beg me to relocate outside of Taipei to teach English. This is where you will find a ripe opportunity for staying and working in Taiwan. English. In fact, it is very difficult to stay here legally if you don't teach English. Luckily, I have avoided the struggle of legal residence here because I am married to a citizen. But those of you who aren't will need to work on establishing yourself here legally. And most of the time, that will mean teaching English. Why? Because Taiwan knows that English is the lingua franca of the world. And the Taiwanese government has made it much easier to obtain legal status here for those who are teaching English. In fact, there is a real hunger for learning English. Quite a few of my students have shown up in my Bible classes because they know that they'll be getting an English lesson. 
The downside is that the Taiwanese government has a thing about college degrees. If you don't have one, they will be reluctant to give you permission to stay in Taiwan for any length of time. So if you don't have a college degree, you will have a bigger struggle. But do not let that keep you from following the Lord's will if he is calling you to Taiwan. I have eight years of university, and it was a colossal waste of time, effort, and money. I congratulate you if you were able to avoid such foolishness, but that will make for a tougher battle here. Another obstacle that you will have is the criminal records check. I have a good friend living here who was saved in prison and almost wasn't able to stay here because he couldn't pass the criminal records check. And yes, they are very serious about that. If your spouse is Taiwanese, you will not get permission to stay if your background check comes up with any felonies. There may be exceptions to this rule, but I don't know what they are. So please keep this in mind if you want to stay here. Now for some really good news. It's really cheap to live here. In fact, the only reason why I can write these articles every day is because my savings goes much, much farther here than either the U.S. or Israel, particularly Israel. For most of you, the cost of living here is at least half, if not a third, of what it would be in the U.S., Housing, food, and health care are a fraction of the cost of that in the United States. Of course, that assumes that you are willing to live like the regular Taiwanese live. But since Taiwan is a modern country, living like a Taiwanese won't be that hard. Take, for example, the many university graduates who come here fresh out of college to teach English. They routinely return to the United States having paid off their student loans. By U.S. standards, their salaries might have been low, but their cost of living was much, much lower. However, I wish that these college kids would stay away because they've been corrupting the Taiwanese girls. There are many times when I wish that I had a baseball bat and permission from God to bash heads. American morals have been a plague here in Taiwan. But I digress. I'm going to stop my story of Taiwan here with some resources that might help you should you wish to pursue life here. The first one is called Foramosa. Foramosa is a play on Taiwan's original name, Formosa. It is one of the most popular forums for expats wanting to share information or just talk to each other. You will also find many of the reasons why I want to bash heads, but you will also find loads of valuable information. You will even find some of my posts on that forum from the days when I was oblivious to our current trouble. The link to that site is www.forumosa.com. Now for a site called Taiwanese. This is a much more family-friendly site run by a really good guy. The English speakers on this forum are much more polite with better morals. Of course, this means fewer expats sharing information there. It's called Taiwanese.com or T-A-I-W-A-N-E-A-S-E dot com. Those two sites will pretty much open Taiwan for you. And if there's something that you're looking for and can't find it on those sites, you'll be able to ask someone. Just remember that you must do your homework first. No one likes having to answer questions that you could have answered for yourself with an easy search. So let me bring you back to my story. After a week in Japan, I went to spend three weeks with my wife's family in Taiwan. I got the worst food poisoning in my life. I got to meet the aunt with a mean right hook, the crazy uncle who was a surgeon, and the rest of her fascinating family. And those three weeks were just enough time to start something that God would pull me into nine months later when we were called back to Taiwan. But that means turning our attention to Israel. My love for Israel is a strange thing, and it comes from two very different places. I was saved at a very young age and quickly saw how important Israel was to God, and as my fascination with reading and all things military grew, I stumbled across the story of this plucky little country that had defied the odds to survive and prosper. What an amazing story! And that story continues to captivate my attention. In fact, I have to be careful here about going off on a tangent and forgetting the point of what I'm trying to write. Suffice it to say that there is endless fascination awaiting anyone who is interested in good stories and bad ones. The bigger question is whether Israel is the place for you. God has given me a profound love for that country and their people, 
but even I am not sure when or even if the Lord will send me back. I want to be there because my heart is there and because I see the hand of the Lord at work there. But I also know that I must wait on God's timing for such things. I also know the difficulties that I would face in choosing to live there. It really is an amazingly expensive place to live. In fact, almost everything there is incredibly expensive, on top of the punishing tax burden that Israelis are forced to pay. It is a country that has been ravaged by war and terrorism that has made Israelis obsessive over security. No one in Israel is untouched by the incredible tragedy that has been forced upon them. The worst of it, of course, is that they are unsaved, which means that they are enemies of Christ. We were all such before we were saved, so it's normal to see this enmity among the Israelis. To expect otherwise is to demonstrate an amazing ignorance of what salvation means. Please, get this into your head. You were a Satanist before you were saved. Did you get that? That's right. You were in league with the devil before you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. To expect Israelis to be different is to be a fool. That's so important that I will put it another way. If you expect Israelis to love Christianity, you are a fool. Did you get that? You are a fool if you expect Israelis to love the fact that you are a Christian. And it drives me crazy to see so many fools who call themselves Christian. And yes, I really mean that you are a fool if you think that unsaved Israelis should be somehow different than what we were before we were saved. So those of you who wish to take me to task for my love of Israel, well, be ready to be called a fool. You know who you are. Okay, I'll calm down. Now, where was I? Ah, yes. The point is that living in Israel is both expensive and a real struggle. Getting any kind of permission to stay in Israel legally is almost impossible. The emotional stress of living there will take a toll on you and your family, and you will face hostility from those Israelis who fear that you were there to take their souls. Please understand that religious Jews believe that converting to Christianity is worse than death, that it will send them to hell. And they believe that the Christians who come to live in Israel are there precisely to capture the souls of their children and take them away. And I completely understand their fear. How would you feel if a Muslim family moved in next door and one of them started sharing the wonderfulness of Islam with your children? Right. You'd want to start bashing heads. Okay, so now you know how Israelis feel. Now this doesn't mean that you will be treated badly. I wasn't, and it's a tribute to how honorable the Israelis are that they were willing to treat me with friendship even though I represented what many of them feared. In fact, you will meet very, very much that is good among the Israelis if you are willing to see it. Although you will also meet the bad. Most of the stories that vilify Israel are completely untrue, but not all of them. There are bad Israelis out there just as with any country or people, but it will be God who deals with that. This is where the biggest problem of all comes in. If there is one verse in the Bible that I dread, it's this one. Quote, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Zechariah 13.8 The context of chapter 12 and chapter 13 of Zechariah is the salvation of Israel. But the above verse also speaks of the great death and destruction that will come just before it. Two-thirds of the people that I love are going to die, and I would do anything to stop that if I could, but I can't, because this is the decree of the Lord. I believe that Jerusalem will be spared, and other parts of Israel will be spared, but I believe that the greatest devastation will be centered on Tel Aviv, which is an exceedingly sinful city. I once tried to move there, but God blocked me. I won't go into all that except to say that Israel is going to go through some horrifyingly bad times, and even though Jerusalem will be spared, it too will suffer, as will all of Israel. Please consider this if God is calling you to Israel. It may cost you your life as well as the lives of those who go with you. If you are okay with that, then that's fine. I am also okay with that since I know that it doesn't matter what happens to me. Serving God when and where he wants is the only important consideration. But there is one extremely bright spot in all of this. Israeli Christians are the only group of people that God has promised to protect from the Antichrist 
And that is fascinating to think about. We see this in Revelation 12, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Jeremiah 30, and elsewhere. Will God protect other groups of Christians from the Antichrist? Well, because the Antichrist is stymied in Revelation 12, it does offer some hope, but not a guarantee. The only biblical guarantee that we have is that at least some portion of Israel will be saved from the Antichrist. Here's the key verse, quote, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. Revelation 12, 14. If you want to be a part of that flight into the wilderness, you must be there. And I have a suspicion that you will need to go through the terrible tragedy of Zechariah 13.8 to be there for the flight into the wilderness. However, I could be wrong about that. It may be possible for you to go to an interim location and wait for Zechariah 13.8 to happen and then get to Israel. I really don't know. Ultimately, it won't matter. The point is to serve the Lord to the best of your ability. If that means risking your life in Israel, that is where you should be. But it also might mean going to Taiwan, Uruguay, the hills of Georgia, or southern Tennessee. But you won't know where you should go if you are not walking with the Lord. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed your sins before God, turned away from them, and asked Him to forgive you? Have you turned off your television and disentangled yourself from the sinfulness of this world? Are you reading the precious Word of God? Are you talking to your Father every day, all day? Are you willing to submit to the Lord's direction wherever He might lead you? If so, then I would have to say that you are ready. The next step would be to seek God's guidance. For those who aren't ready, I think that you know what you need to do. I truly hope that you'll be ready for this. That's a link. There's not much time left. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22, 3. This has been the Weekend Shockcast for Saturday, October 11th, 2014. I'm John Little of OmegaShock.com, and I hope you